read this because I had written it down. Um, this is Sebastian Eisep. Um, and in some ways, it's particularly fitting that Martin Bowers, an artist who trained at the Royal Academy in London, who later turned to making lutes and with a particular skill and interest in restoration, should work on these lutes, which were brought over to England by Sebastian Eisep, an artist born in 1884, who trained in the Academy of Bildung und Kunst in Vienna, who himself made at least one lute and who became world famous as a picture restorer. He was part of the Vienna Succession Group together with Egon Schiele and Oskar Kokoschka. And in World War I, he actually volunteered to go uh, to join the army and was stationed at the Italian front where he was badly injured. And after the war, he abandoned his artistic career because his injuries were too bad, but took up picture restoration. And by the 1920s, he was working as a restorer and he headed the conservation department at the Vienna Kunsthistorisches Museum. So already he was right at the top of, of the tree. And after Austria's annexation um, in 1938, uh, Isaac and his family had to flee to Britain because his wife, Helena, um, her main name was Hammerschlag, um, was Jewish. And so they, they realized they were at serious risk. Um, and because he was an enemy alien, um, he was briefly interned. Um, but then uh, Kenneth Clark and others knew of how important a, a restorer he was. So he was employed by the National Gallery to restore their paintings, which were then in the Welsh slave mines. So he was immediately set to work. Um, and Kenneth Clark was really impressed with his, um, his intelligence and his uh, wide knowledge. And he wasn't just a technical restorer. He was, a, he was a, an intellectual restorer in a way as well. Um, so after the war, he worked on important paintings in the Bodleian, the Ashmolean, the Tate, the National Gallery, and almost all the stately homes of England. So he was a, a major figure. And it's perhaps even more fitting because Bob Spencer first became interested in the lute from coming across its music in the Thomas Plume Library when he was evacuated to Malden during the war, the very town where Martin now lives and works. So it's all really rather a perfect circle. Um, it's, yes, oh, we'll, so that's Martin. I said, and this is, I'm going to talk about this one first, <coughs> the 1584. Can I, uh, yes. pause you for a moment? <laughs> okay, yes, levels? <laughs> right, you almost might not recognize it from these rather, um, well, wonderful photographs from the museum website, but, um, the actual instrument, as we've looked at, just looked at it, is incredibly much darker. So, uh, but it is that, that very instrument. Um, these three lutes were among 35 instruments which Sebastian Isep brought over to England in 1938. And after his death in 1954, they went into an auction in Christie's on the 2nd of February 1956. They didn't sell. And Bob later approached his widow, Helene, and bought these three lutes privately in 1964. So it was eight years later. So this is the 1584 venery, um, and here are the, um, the labels inside it. And you can see a, a really good genuine label, an early label of veneries before they, he cut off his um, uh, Leonardo Tiefenbrucker's part of the label, which he tended to do later, presumably after Leonardo had died and a repair label by Matthias Greiser, uh, Lauten und Geigenmacher in Innsbruck in 1761, so an 18th century, um, an 18th century sort of conversion, or we don't really know what it was. Bob first took it to, to uh, these, these are all um, photocopy, these are photographs of photocopies of photocopies of photos. <laughs> Um, that Martin took and then Bob collected and then Martin got photocopies of those. So the quality is not of the, of the finest, but it's all we have. There may be Bob's original pictures, some, or Martin's original pictures collected by Bob somewhere in the Royal, Royal Academy, but um, they, we don't know. They may take some digging out. Um, there's a nice surviving Mandora by Grisa in Copenhagen as well. So he basically was a Mandora maker, 
um, an 18th century. So Bob first took it to Ian Harwood um, and for restoration. And this is it in 1972, before Ian's restoration, probably pretty well as bought by her, from Helene Isep. It's got a treble rider and a completely open peg box with some really badly drilled peg holes completely out of line. It's not quite, it, it's difficult to tell, but it seems to be nine courses. Um, and then, um, and here it is after Ian's restoration. Ian has evidently made a new peg box with carved openwork back. It's still a nine course, but there's no treble rider, but the string length has been reduced really rather drastically from 6.73 millimetres to 6.48. So Bob obviously, well, both, uh, two of the instruments being uh, pretty drastically shortened, um, but he obviously wanted to find it easier to play. Um, so that's at the end of Ian Harwood's restoration. And then, oh, that appears, yes. Um, then Bob took it to <coughs> Martin, Martin Bowers, in 1977 for further restoration and modification. And this is the photograph of the opened back after Bob asked Martin to convert it to an eight-course instrument. So it almost certainly wasn't a nine-course when it left Vainery's workshop. It could just have been an eight-course, but it was probably seven. And um, from the string leg, six, seven, three, that would have been a, a very nice um, F lute had it been left as it was. But it's now a, um, well, six, four, eight is a bit sort of, it's one of those odd measurements from the early period. So it was probably tuned in G. Um, so um, Martin had to do quite a lot of work on it. From the notes written on, the, on this sheet, you can see that Martin had to make a new peg box, um, a new soundboard with a copy of the original rose, a new bridge, a new ebony fingerboard, a new cotton lace, and repair lots of splits in the back. The back itself was incredibly thin and buckled in places, and they decided to leave it mostly in that state. And guess what he charged for that? Well, you can see it there, 270 pounds. <laughs> um, it's hard to tell who made the original soundboard. Well, there's, there's new information as of this morning. I've said, um, well, Bob kept it safe, and it's now part of the, um, the, um, the Royal Academy collection. It might have been Greaser's work, but the rose is typical of venery. It's got that so-called Leonardo Lott um, thing. But I've said here that it's highly unlikely to be what the um, RAM says, that it's a 19th century work. But apparently, I've just heard that they had dendrochronology done on it, and it is 19th century. I'd like to double check that, because it looks to me, the rose, I haven't got the picture of the rose um, uh, on, on the screen here, but um, the rose doesn't look like 19th century work at all to me. Um, it, it looks like, well, it looks like a venery, but it could be greaser, although the, those 18th century Germans tended to do rather sloppy rose, rose carving, um, Tielke in particular. Um, but they, they tended to be not as good as the Germans working in Italy, like venery. So I don't know, it's got, um, six pinhole um, at the bridge, pinholes at the bridge point, so it undoubtedly was converted at some stage to a guitar, but who, by whom? That would put it with the early 19th century that they have as their, um, as their dendrochronology, but there's no label in it relating to this at all. So if somebody had made a new soundboard and converted it to a guitar, well, normally one would expect a label in it. So I'm still a bit doubtful about this, but anyway, there we are. Um, and the bars, the bar behind the bridge, could that one that's been replaced and turned into a, a J bar could almost be the work of Isep himself, because you'll see right at the end, um, that's what he tended to do. Um, so that's all the information we've managed to dig out about that loot. And next, we've got the Rizzle. And he was a Mandora maker, and it's an 18th century 
instrument, um, and it patently was a Mandora when Bob bought it. But this is before the work of um, Dieter Kirsch and Donald Gill and Martin Hodgson, who've all worked heavily on the idea of Mandoras as being separate instruments. So it, it looks as if Bob had the idea, really, that he was this was a, a crypto-Renaissance lute, and he was going to turn it into a Renaissance lute. So um, he, this is a record sheet, um, and this records its state after he'd had a bit of work done on it. It's not clear who did this work. It might have been Ian Harwood since he took the other two lutes to Ian. I suspect it probably was. Um, so he'd, he'd shortened the neck and he'd widened the neck and put a fingerboard instead of the stained black surface to the, to the, uh, to the neck, which was a, a common German. The niggle, for instance, in a, a similar uh, Mandora has just black stained neck. Um, and the strange procedure of cutting out the rows to glue the bars, it says on there, which is very odd, um, but it's not clear who did this. But it's clear from this sheet how seriously Bob took details of the string spacing. You can see he's absolutely, really, very, uh, thinks that's really important. But it's odd that he should have the string length shortened from 656 to 584. So he's, he's turned it from really quite a, um, a normal long mandora to a Renaissance lute in G. And it's obviously, uh, to my eye, this is what he thought he was getting. It was an old back and he was going to turn it into a Renaissance lute. Um, so, but he evidently didn't find the, um, the instrument really, or it was, as it were, disposable because he sold it the next year to Jeremy Barlow. Um, and we should remember that Bob was always buying and selling things because he sort of uh, dealt and he, he was always short of money and would move money around. Um, and it's quite possible he'd come across an important manuscript and he needed some cash to buy the manuscript. But anyway, he obviously remembered it because um, the, he bought it back again in 1974 and took it to Martin, who was the man, um, and it certainly needed attention. It was completely worm-eaten in the back and the soundboard, and these are the rather horrifying pictures of what, if you look at that one at the middle on the uh, right-hand side, you can see how Martin had to cut out whole chunks of the, of the, um, the back and graft in new. And I don't think you can see the... <laughs> you can't see it in the original instrument anymore. It's really good. But it's, um, the thing is that it was a blackened... It was, um, it was a blackened... Uh, it was sycamore, um, and so it was stained black, the back. So that helps to cover up things like that. There was also a large reinforcing plate under the, um, under the bridge which Martin had to remove and make new bars to fit the fan bar tracings that were still visible. You could see the glue lines un underneath the, the big block. You can see the block uh, in the top right-hand thing, and there on the top left is Martin's um, fan bar uh, structure, which is correct for a Mandora, um, an 18th century one. He also is, had to um, work on the soundboard. You can see the soundboard edging has had to be reinforced and rebuilt entirely, so it's um, very badly worm damaged. Um, the, the puzzle is the nail, this is Bob's writing, nail through the neck block emerged in the neck was cut off and a hole filled by me, 1956. And Martin can't work out what on earth this means because there's no evidence that he took it apart in 1956. That wasn't really Bob's kind of work. So what, this is a puzzle, uh, but there's a photograph and it looks as if the necks emerge, uh, the nail has emerged from the neck. So there, there is another <coughs> surviving um, Mandora in Geneva with a string length of 667. 
and you can see the longer neck with space for over 10 frets. So this is more or less how Bob's instrument would have been originally. And there's the entry in Lütgendorf for Andreas Ressel. Um, he spells his name either with two S's or one in the various labels. Um, one of the finest makers of his time. Had an but it's interesting to see... Yes. Okay, good. At least you can see the long neck, and th th that is a typical Mandora sort of look. Um, they, I mean, the Mandora is an interesting business. This strange idea of going, going back to a simplified lute in the 18th century, um, giving it a different name. The museum has called it um, Mandor Gallicon. The spellings are all sorts of things, and the word Gallicon crops up here and there, and it's not at all clear what anybody really meant. Uh, but they do seem to have had this name, Mandor. Probably Mandora rather than Mandor, which seems to be a French thing. So that's that instrument. And finally, this one, which is the 1585 venery. So it's just a year later than the other one. But of course, it wasn't made like this. It wasn't made as a, a German Baroque lute. It was probably another, um, another Renaissance seven-course lute, I imagine. It was converted, um, so that's to, you've heard it, um, and this is, these are the, um, uh, the labels. Converted to a German Baroque, probably by Johannes Uldalricus Eberle, Lauten und Geigenmacher in Prague in 1729. That would seem about right. Um, that's actually quite early for a German Baroque lute, uh, but it probably was him because the other repair label is 1822 by a harp maker. I have no idea where, the, where he was. Um, um Anyway, I've got the, the, the letters are there, but I, I tried to look it up on Google. I couldn't find any trace of the, where that was, but presumably um, Bohemia, Czechoslovakia. Um, the, so at some stage it was thought important enough to uh, convert to a German Baroque lute. And this is probably the original rose. This is the rose that Bob believed to be the original from Tiefenbrucker, from uh, Venery, which had been let into the 19th century soundboard. So the, 19, the Prutka, uh, Prutka made another soundboard um, this is just from Bob's notes. He thought that it was uh, a 19th century soundboard and that the original rose had been let into it. Um, Venery is mostly associated with the Leonardo type knot, the interlace knot that uh, was on the first lute. Um, but I don't know if I included, no, I didn't. Um, but there is a, a lute rose with concentric circles, very like this by Venery in Budapest, a, a, a big lute. It, I should, probably should have put it in because it's got a comic lion in the centre of it, um, really bizarrely badly carved. But the actual rose is lovely and it's got lots of concentric circles like this. So I'm inclined to believe that Bob's right and this, this was the original rose. Once again, Bob took it to Ian Harwood for restoration in 1969. So Ian Harwood was the, the go-to man at that stage. Um, and the go-to soundboard material at that stage was cedar. Um, various people had popularised cedar because it sounded um, played in straight away. It had got a very warm, sort of attractive sound, but it lacks the top edge. And so a lot of the characteristic... Um, treble harmonics of a lute were lost by this, um, the cedar. And I think you, it's still got the cedar soundboard on, and I think you could hear it there. It's, it's, it's very round and immediately attractive, but it lacks some of the potential for a good player to exploit. Um, I'm trying to think. There were various... Um, Tony Rooley played cedar-fronted lutes at that stage, and Philip McLeod Coop popularised it and made a lot of cedar-fronted lutes. So it was, it was in the wind at the time. Um, so Ian copied the rose 
Uh, and you can see from that diagram that he called it my Tiefenbrucker Theorbo. Tiefenbrucker is, is, by the way, uh, Venery was the sort of the name of, that was adopted by Vendelius Tiefenbrucker, um, but he was, and signed himself as Venery, and only moderately recently was uh, tax returns found that identified the two firmly as being the, the same person. But there was a, a, a period when people were doubting that. Um, and so this was before Bob's article in 1976, which went into whether things should be called the orb, this kind of loot should be called a theorbo. And he decided in that article that um, they should really be called German Baroque lutes. It's a, it's a serious problem because it, sort of everything with free strings tends to get called theorbos uh, all throughout Europe. So Ian replaced the soundboard. He then took it to... Uh, ah, yes, that's, that's that. Um, yes, I slipped a cog there, bought from that. And he then took it to Martin, who took the front off and rebarred it with a Hoffman barring to fit the German Baroque form of the instrument. Hoffman, uh, this is the Hoffman barring from the uh, Nuremberg Martin Hoffman, and it's, uh, it's Martin's, um, Martin's notes of the thicknesses and, and the position he put things in. And he made a new replacement bridge uh, with Bob's stipulated spacing, but he asked, as you can see, um, he told Bob, um, Martin not to tinker with any of the finish and not to polish it up or anything. He was generally concerned to do the minimum necessary, but of course he was interested in making things playable for himself, so he has shortened instruments. But most of the, most of the criminal work was done by Ian. So, <laughs> um, and once again, the bill was not huge for all that work. And notice that now, after his 1976 early music article, the lute is being called a German Baroque lute in the... Can you read those? No? Oh dear, sorry. I thought, I, I did wonder, they're a bit kind of, a bit vague even in, but we might be able to print them better. I'll sharpen them up to the good magazines. Ah, good. <laughs> sorry. I did put them through sharpening and lightening and everything. I've sort of done a, as much work as I could on them, but they, I thought they might come up legible on the screen. Oh, isn't it? It could be that, yes. It hasn't expanded it sideways, has it? <laughs> anyway, Do Martin did lots of other restoration work on other instruments for Bob and other people, and he also made him many instruments. And here's Bob trying a new lute in Martin's workshop. And here, finally, is a lute made by Sebastian Isep himself in 1924, currently being restored by Martin. It's absolutely right in all sorts of details. Light, thin soundboard, flattened cross-section back, and lots of things absolutely right. So much more advanced than anything that was being done in England. 1924. This is, I mean, it's really, really impressive. But he was a, an important picture restorer, and um, he did... He did also have access to a lot of instruments easily in Germany and, and Austria. So he will have been able to see those instruments in Vienna more easily than Ian or others. But I mean, this is earlier, this is, this is 1924. So on a final personal note, I think Martin and Sebastian Isep would have got on together. Both were practical experts used to restoring with care and attention. And it's good to see them linked in this way by the Royal Academy collection.
No, no, no. So it's the same pencil. Putting bits back. Yes. <laughs> that's the violin tradition. I mean, that's commonplace to this day in violins, isn't it? I mean, all, all the Stradivarius's have been... Have been re have been re Yes, so yes. It's not really in order to make them it was off the time. playable. It was off the time. <laughs> yes. Okay, so any more questions, Mike? The, um, the 1584 one is <coughs> allowing the distortion it is very, very close to the C36, 1582 model. Yes. Um, even to the extent that I, I used the sections of box one, because I have four sections from that. <laughs> Yes. It's highly likely made on the same same mould. Well, it has two more ribs. Right, yes. Yes, there's a moot point about how, how schematic those moulds were. Not a single mould has survived. There's one that um, Jost Aman uh, woodcut shows what might be a mould or it might be a, might be a back. But uh, all we have is, is the reference by uh, Arnau. Uh, much earlier about how moulds were made. <laughs> Technology, Gov. <laughs> it's, 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 this is our this is our webmaster. <laughs> no, it, it, important things are happening. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Which, I mean, goodness knows how it actually stays on undistorted. Uh, I mean, it is, it's one of the most delicate designs. Actually, that's interesting because um, <coughs> if I go back, um, there it is. Uh, that's there. If you look, the, he's um, put a, a thick section on the lower peg box, yes. which uh, Hoffman didn't do. And that strengthens up things enormously. And so, so I. The transition from the lower peg box to the upper peg box. Is very thin. Very yes, it is. Yes. I, I wonder with this loot, I mean, Martin has an idea on this. I think I'm right in saying that the capping strip is not the original, it's a, it's a later capping strip. And I've often wondered, because I mean, you can't tell from these, but we saw the instrument, the shape is so different from. Uh, I've often wondered whether this could come under the category of what appears in the barrel manuscript as cut loot, ah. i.e. a loot that has been uh, well, pulled apart, sounds a bit violent, but in other words separated and the ribs reshaped mm. to create a shape which was much more fashionable uh, in, in, in the 18th century. This doesn't look fantastically venery shaped, does it? No, That's... Well, it doesn't. I mean, Yes. Oh, do you think these have been distorted as well? They've all been distorted. Ah. Oh, right. So maybe it is something. Ah, right. Because they they weren't in. Ah. How strange. I think that may be this. This bit of technology. Because, uh, yeah. And of course, from here, I can't. <laughs> I can't tell anyway. But. Right. There's been a lot of attempts to find cut loops everywhere. But, uh, well, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the Wolf, yes. Yes, yes. The and Wolf the, has been the, suggested. The one which I think is labelled front, but possibly later in the work. Hmm. Martin, what about the N class? Do you remember? I don't remember. No. I wasn't looking at the time. No, no. Yes, yes. And it's surprisingly, if that is um, Ebella's work, um, it is surprisingly early for such an elegant looking um, German Baroque shape. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, I, we could we could look him up in Lutgendorf if he's got it right, but I I didn't follow. Thomas Edlinger didn't make small Oh, this is not Edlinger. Is it not connected to Edlinger? 
Uh, this is not, uh, this is Ebella. Oh, Ebella. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, Right, yeah, yeah. No, Edlinger didn't. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I don't know. I don't know how he fits into No, there's, there's lots of them. Yeah, okay. Still working in the same place. Yes, yes. He is. Thirty-five. Does anyone know what happened to the other eight? Well, one of one of them. It, I don't know. Yes, yes, exactly. I'll, I'll put it back. Yes, there. We, um, Martin had the idea that this was he, that he'd got army boots on, yeah. and that this was probably taken in Italy. And then we noticed the Chianti bottle, <laughs> and so it was probably while he was um, in Italy. So maybe he was picking up things even there. Yes, uh, and especially in wartime, with chaos and things going on, people might have been prepared to flog their instruments to feed themselves or whatever. Um, so but the 35 instruments are all kinds of instruments? They all, well, the uh, guitars and all flutes. Guitar, yeah. I don't know. The guitars might have just disappeared into the... Yes, the, well, if it was one of those, it might... Yeah. But it's a substantial quantity, isn't it? Um, is there a catalogue of the sale? The attendance sale? Ah, there probably is. I haven't looked it up, but Christie's might... might... Yes, they do. Um, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Because I don't know from these notes um, how many of the instruments were in that sale, even. Uh, I mean, his, his wife, Helene, was a famous opera singer, and she taught at the Royal, Royal College, and she taught all sorts of people. She, I mean, she was big, big, big name. And if you look her up on Wikipedia, it's, oh, well, she was married to this picture restorer. <laughs> and he managed to find a, he, he managed to find some kind of work uh, after the war. <laughs> so I think she was a big opera singer. Um, anyway, she, she taught Janet Baker and, and everybody. So she was, she was big, big name. Um, and she was big in Austria before she came over at... So they were, a, and then Martin Isep was a was a, an important pianist as well. So it's it's quite a, a musical dynasty, quite a musical family. Any questions? Um, could I ask the students who play, um, Jack and Sergio and Juliet, uh, did you have any feelings about the particular qualities of these instruments? Or? <laughs> I did, yeah, I think it was. I, I never played a personal cigar and pop instrument until this morning. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that this sort of told me about was, yeah, the all the, the type of restoration that was, um, you know, very much of its time now. Uh, just feels totally different to my 11 chord suits. But I quite enjoyed it in the end. I thought it was interesting. I like the spacing of the instrument. I don't know, just holding something that old is sort of quite firing always anyway. So, yeah, that's my, my take on it. It's a nice sort of balance. They're all balanced. They, they sound, they've got a very stable sound across the range, I thought. Mm. Any other thoughts? We really try to, I mean, have a look. Yes, I think what we'll probably do, we've got a, a mini recital now, a French head 
and then afterwards, I think we'll uh, we'll go have, have a bit of a photo shoot. It'll be nice if we're going to photograph all people who come from Royal Academy and some we'll do some nice frame post pictures of you playing. That's all right. All the original instruments. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, thank Good. you very much, Martin, for all your work those years ago, and thank you, David, for.